On this program for years now, we've covered a slew of corruption trials, and they all have really one thing in common. They were impacted by the Supreme Court case that overturned the corruption conviction of the former Virginia governor, Bob McDonald. And that, in essence, it redefined the very meaning of corruption. And I've argued we still have not been clear, at least maybe till today, what that definition is. Well, since that ruling, the case against New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez ended in a hung jury. The convictions of Shelley Silver and Dean Skelis in New York both overturned. They're both being retried. As they say, the jury's still out on that one. I want to bring in our legal panel to take a look at why the Prococo case could be different than the others and if they're surprised by the verdict. Jim Kassouris, the criminal defense attorney in Manhattan, sits on the board of directors in the New York City Criminal Bar Association, as well as fre frequently lurk lecturing, if I can say, speaking in English here, at the New York Law School and the Bar Associations in Queens in New York City. Also joined by former federal prosecutor Daniel Goldman, who's very kind to shorten up that. Mayo Bartlett, attorney at the law offices of uh, Mayor Bartlett, PLLC, and a former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County DA's office, and former federal prosecutor Andrew Bauer. All right, guys, first off, if I told you yesterday the jury would come back after all this deliberation and the snow delays and all the rest with three guilty um, findings here for Prococo, would you have been shocked? Or do you think, given how this played out, not at the beginning of the trial, but how the trial played out, that it would have ended the way it did. Well, and don't as play Kreskin. As, as I said last week, of course I wouldn't have been surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you never know what a jury is doing. You really don't. And it turns out that it just may be that they were hung up on the other defendants but and not. That is what it turned out. It. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Well, yeah. So. Um, and to be fair to them, it's say that it, it says they were doing their job if they found a distinction with a difference between the four defendants. What I find interesting, though, and, and you, you guys have, have been in there a lot more than I have. You lived there for so long. Wouldn't you have expected a note from the jury as opposed to we're hung, we want to go home, we'll never reach a verdict, perhaps a note saying we've reached a verdict with respect to one of the defendants but not the others? I mean, they went for so long and their notes were really pointed and, and specific. Well, it was a very obedient jury right. because they right. are instructed not to say how they are coming out, whatever they are. By the way, that's the first time I've heard obedient in this jury, exactly? given the yeah, fact yeah. that they threatened not to show up, but, but <laughs> Dan being but charitable, they, they, yeah. They followed that rule. Yeah, and, they and did. I actually had a case that ended in a mistrial because someone refused to deliberate and there were huge fights and they, no one brought it to the attention of the judge. You know, so it does happen. I, I yeah. thought, Dan, there'd be an argument, and, and I want to talk, there's a lot of things that came out, but one of it which was, couldn't they argue, maybe it's not the right legal term, but coercion here where the jury was almost bullied into coming into a verdict because time after time, you know, Judge Caproni is like, get back in there. And some of them said, well, we have, uh, you know, this one's got childcare issues. You got till two o'clock here. You're not going anywhere. We spent a lot of money basically on this trial. Is that a viable argument on appeal? So it's an argument they likely will make and it's an argument they likely will lose. Um, it, it is, there is some degree and some point when it can be coercive. Um, but from my understanding of what Judge Caproni did here, she actually in, didn't even go as far as she's legally permitted to, right. to do. But there, there certainly are issues about being coercive with time limits and mm -hmm. deadlines and things like that, that if, if it's clear or, or to the jury that They've got until, you know, 2 p.m. in order right. to come up with a verdict. But, you know, the nature of the beast is that days go on and they end and the weekend's on Friday and there are a lot of Friday afternoon and, verdicts. And, you know, Andrew, we're showing right now um, the verdicts, uh, the, the guilty counts uh, against Prococo and also what uh, he was acquitted of. You heard multiple defense attorneys saying these are inconsistent verdicts. Explain for the audience what that means and how much of a viable uh, grounds that is for appeal. So generally speaking, an inconsistent verdict would mean that uh, two members of a conspiracy are charged and one gets convicted and one doesn't. That's an example of, a, of an inconsistent verdict. And uh, I mean, first of all, let me just say that inconsistent verdicts happen all the time. There's nothing uh, implicitly um, wrong or in this case will implicitly will, will succeed um, on appeal just simply because there's an, in an inconsistent verdict. Here, I, I'm not sure it's, it's an inconsistent verdict. The two charges of conspiracy uh, for which Prococo was uh, convicted, uh, 
it, the jury didn't say who the co-conspirators were, and it very easily could be that the co-conspirators were Joseph Percogo and Todd Howe. And, mm. and in fact, given the fact that, that they deadlocked on Kelly, uh, and, but didn't deadlock on Percogo, that, that very much could be the case. You know, Mayo, um, both Andrew and Dan, uh, to be fair, said that the Howe testimony um, as horrific as it seemed to me and the consequences may not have been the end of the world. Now, I figured that was from PTSD from these guys having gone through with horrible <laughs> witnesses down there. But did you think that uh, that wasn't going to sink this thing? That he was such an unbelievable and uncredible and such a, a slimy guy that in the end of the day, I thought it was a stake through the heart of this prosecution case. Obviously, I was wrong. Well, I think that you, you have to look beyond him, and the entire prosecution didn't necessarily hinge upon him. And the thing that's different with Prococo is that a lot of the other cases, you know, you have a question, you can, you can debate whether it's a, a normal gift that friends would exchange, things along those lines. But here you have a guy who's allegedly working in the government office still after he's no longer employed by the state, and he's doing business from that office. That's unique. You're not going to find that in many other cases. So when you just look at that alone, it, it gives you um, a tremendous amount of weight for the government. And, and you are right. There was other evidence, too, uh, from the day of the raid here through all the phone calls that were made, obviously the infamous ZD. Okay, so, Jimmy, the verdict comes down. Now, let's say you're representing Mr. Prococo and you've had some colorful clients in the past, and these two guys are on the other side here high-fiving, okay? <laughs> at this point, Beyond looking at grounds for appeal, do you start the conversations to say, all right, guys, my guy knows more. Um, what kind of uh, an arrangement can we make here? Is that still on the table now or no? Look, it's, <clears throat> it's or is that ship passed now that we got the conviction? Well, it depends. You know, once somebody is convicted and then they come to the table and offer cooperation, uh, the offer is a little bit more dubious. The credibility may may be a little bit tainted. You know, you put us to our proof. You took your shot. You lost, and all of a sudden now you have information. But it all depends on what he has to offer, how it can be corroborated. Uh, the more valuable the information is, uh, there are Rule 35 motions that are made all the time. Rule 35 is cooperation after you're convicted. Uh, and it, happens and it could all also the time. be, as mentioned by Dominic, there's a second corruption trial. There's multiple corruption trials, but a second one relating at least uh, on the state level, and that's the Buffalo Billions case. So theoretically, the prosecutors, right, that are involved in that case could say, we think your guy, uh, Mr. Prococo here, <laughs> he's got some valuable information. Now, how would that work? Would they talk to the prosecutors who just closed this case and say, I'd like to make an arrangement now? Or do they wait until he's fully sentenced and then do it? No, they would do it as soon as possible, um, particularly if there's an upcoming trial where he could testify. That's unusual. Right. Most cases, you know, your, your trial's over and the case has really been investigated. You know, certainly the government is investigating it more and more as you're leading up to trial. It's rare that you would have great information that the government's unaware of that's really essential to doing something else on a charged case. You might be able to charge another case. Mm -hmm. So if, if Prococo wants to cooperate, he actually, in theory, has a better opportunity than most uh, defendants who are convicted after trial. The, the real difference, he didn't testify, so that's helpful because you can't use his testimony against him and right. most likely him testifying that I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, and then he's convicted is almost a, a stake in the heart of any po possible but because cooperation. because you guys always um, would go up the food chain, would you ever now come and say, listen, before sentencing, now's the time to talk here. Um, we had a strong case, you disagreed, but obviously we prevailed at the end of the day. If you've got something to say, you know, before we come right back here to the Southern Courthouse, um, you know, in a few months here, um, now's the time to talk. I, I probably would not reach out I think it would be a situation where if Prococo wanted to cooperate, it would be from his lawyer saying, right. hey, let's, can we talk now? You know, we gave it our best shot. It didn't work out. We've got another trial coming up now. Yep. We, we'd like to try to get out from under this. And finally, Andrew, um, given how many of these cases uh, have been overturned, um, is there a sense that, well, whether this one sticks or not, Yes, he could be looking, I guess, at the max at 50 if you maxed out all three charges, that you kind of work out an arrangement now that 
um, to a more equitable settlement, let's say for term or whatever, so they're going to forego the appeal? How does the process work? Because they certainly seem dead set they're going to try. Sure. Well, listen, there, um, it, it, it won't work the way you, you, uh, you said there. Um, and frankly, it, it almost never works out that, that the uh, government and the defense coordinate on a particular sentence. If somebody cooperates in, like, a, like a Todd Howe, even in that situation, the government is not recommending a specific sentence to the judge. Um, in some situations, what the government will do, the, the most they'll probably go, is recommend what they say is a below guideline sentence. There's, mm. there's sentencing guidelines well, well beneath 50 years, probably closer to the five year range. I haven't calculated them. <clears throat> But then the government might recommend something below that. But it wouldn't be arranged and coordinated with defense, certainly not with the court either. And it doesn't tie to judges' hands anyway. Right. Uh, you know, Mayo, um, well, you heard it. Um, I, I went on my whole uh, screed on that you can't get a conviction anymore. You know, what is corruption? And now all of a sudden they got to prove me wrong here. Um, that said, what does it tell you, and I know I'm over time, Larry, that the case that looks to actually uh, maybe there's grounds for appeal i would say it's unlikely at this moment i don't think you're gonna have the same issue of charging the jury the right way or wrong way that a lobbyist whose job it is basically to trade influence he he i agree that i think the jury got it right today okay but that a lobbyist is more likely than anyone else to be spending time in the pokey than the politicians who've done in my eyes as if not worse well, it remains to be seen what the sentence is going to be, number one. I still have an issue with, uh, with the Allen charge and how long you hold the jury and how long you've told a jury that they're going to be there in the first place. So if you tell the jury, yeah, we'll be done by, by March 1st, and now it's March 13th, you know, people have trips. They, they really have other obligations in life. So do you start to lose these people? Have they only promised you justice through March 1st? And at what point... Uh, you know, do people who were firmly uh, grounded in their beliefs decide they're just going to shift to get it over? I got to think that's a little, that's a hard one to, to flip this thing on. It's a hard one, but I, I, I tired, think man. they get tired they and they make tired. promises and the people who get punished ultimately, it's going to be the defense mm -hmm. because the defense are the last ones you hear. All right. Coming up next, I know you know the name, uh, Stormy Daniels. And as much as it's got titillation and everything else, it could also be a major problem for the president here. This one, it sounds like a movie of the week, porn star and the president, but it is getting messier by the day. And the attorney for Ms. Daniels threw the gauntlet down earlier this afternoon. We'll tell you the latest developments and I'll ask the guys where they think it goes from here.